Well, I grew up in North Staffordshire. All my relations were farmers and I spent all my holidays working on farms and helping them out on farms. And we, there wasn't a combine to be seen within 20 miles of where I lived. So all the soils were, were underneath permanent pasture. It was all sheep, beef and dairy farmed land. And when I dug holes in the soil, I was quite used to seeing 12 inches of deep black topsoil. And I thought that was natural. That was, that was what I grew up with. I, I hadn't seen anything different. And I was, I was shocked and quite horrified when I moved to East Anglia and saw the, the hungry soils. You picked up a handful of it and it, it, it didn't smell right. Very well farmed on a, from a traditional point of view, from a conventional point of view, cultivated and ploughed, but there was just no life in them. Here in North Hertfordshire, which is very typical of a lot of East Anglia, it's cultivated land, it's often plough-based cultivations, so the soils are turned over each year. We have a, a typical example behind me of land that has been ploughed, it's been cultivated, it's been planted with winter wheat in this case, and it will grow through, through the winter and through the spring to be harvested next summer before it's then planted again. So it's monoculture farming and it's a continual process. A typical rotation would be on a four-year basis, so we'd grow two crops of wheat, a crop of oilseed raven, a break crop, beans or oats. Every four years that, that cycle would be repeated. And it's all plough-based, it's high inputs, lots of artificial fertiliser, lots of agrochemicals required to control the weeds and to control, control the insects and control the fungal diseases. There are quite a few flaws with the system. I mean, the biggest one in my eyes is that, is that soil is a finite resource and the very process of cultivating it as we do, it's breaking down the structure of the soil. We're not encouraging any biological activity in the soil, we're actually starving the biology, both physically starving it of food and we're also breaking up the structure of the soil, so we're ruining the habitat of, of the biology as well. I'm talking about things like earthworms, invertebrates, right down to bacterial and fungal level. And the problem is that once we start to disrupt this biology and it starts to, to, starts to die out and reduce in, the actual population numbers reduce, we then lose all the benefits that the biology brings. So we start to lose things like um, glomerulins and glues that actually hold the soil structure together and actually start to form the soil structure. So once we start to lose the glomerulins, we then have problems with water logging and, and ponding on the surface. We have anaerobic soils. We have a lack of fertility. And we suddenly have a, a more and more sterile soil, which requires more and more artificial inputs to, to feed the crop growing there. And we're in, a, we're in a downward cycle, really. And that, to me, is the biggest problem that we're facing as farmers. I don't think we'll ever beat nature. We have to actually work hand in hand with nature rather than fight it. One of the obvious solutions to me is we've got to return to a way of farming that we did 60 or 80 or 100 years ago when it was true mixed farming. Because soils that are lacking in biology actually need livestock as part of the rotation they need to be putting this biology back into the ground and need to be feeding the bugs that live in the ground um, so that's one of the key principles behind my thinking is to get cattle back onto the land some of the work i've found in in places like argentina have shown that cattle on the land can actually improve fertility for up to 10 or 12 years after the cattle have departed so you get the benefits of cattle on the land this extra fertility the reduced inputs uh, you would need the cattle on the land to get that benefit for probably three or four years within the rotation. But then, as I say, you get the benefits for 10 or 12 years afterwards. So instead of a four-year rotation, arable farmers need to be looking at a 10 or 12 or 14-year rotation where grass forms a part of that rotation. You get cattle onto the grass, onto the forage crops, and then you can grow and take an advantage of, of the fertility with your following wheat and oilseed rape and bean crops. The big the big issue with that is that a lot of arable farmers don't actually want to become livestock farmers. So whilst that's an issue, it's also a tremendous opportunity for young people. Young people who want to get into farming could actually take on this land on a sort of contract farming or a rental basis and they could farm, uh, say, a quarter of an arable farm that's down to grass and could, could rent it and pay a, a rental equivalent for three years whilst that land is down to grass and then as the farmer moves his rotation around the farm, the, the young entrant, the new entrant, could move his cattle around the farm and he could pay a rent for doing it. The arable farmer could then focus on what he's good at, which is growing crops, but he can also take advantage of this extra fertility and the livestock farmer, the new entrant livestock farmer, would have access to land, which at the moment he doesn't have under the present system. My 
the second strand of my repair kit for soil, if you like, is the short duration high density grazing. In mob grazing, and you basically bunch the cattle up and move them very frequently. It really, it's a way of emulating nature. I mean, if you, if you think about the grass plants of the world, they evolved in conjunction with the huge herds of bison or, or of aurochs in Europe or of wildebeest in Africa. It's a huge herds, and they could number in, the, in millions. They would form tight packs, so they would mob together naturally, and they would be constantly on the move, constantly moving to new pastures. So grasses have evolved under that kind of regime. They had this heavy, amount of trampling and heavy amount of grazing but then the herds would be gone and the grasses could could recover over many months now if you start to introduce mob grazing so you use electric fences you mob the cattle together naturally and they they actually instinctively like to graze like that and they're then moved very frequently onto new pasture then we move them to replicate the, the constant movement of these great herds of yesteryear Another key feature of mob grazing is that you let the plants grow to a lot larger size, so you give them longer recovery periods. So instead of your traditional 21 or 28 day grazing rotation, where the cattle come back to the same pasture, bit of pasture every 28 days, say, under mob grazing it could be anything 60, 80 or 100 days, a really long recovery time. The beauty of that is that you get a huge amount of forage growing above ground. The, the grass plant or the forage plant has time to complete its life cycle so you get seed heads and you get long stalks and you get lots of leaf and you also get below ground a uh, uh, the amount of forage is mimicked in the root length so instead of on a, the short roots you get under a very quick rotation the roots have time to develop so you've got huge amounts of organic matter both above and below the soil now this organic matter is effectively captured sunlight the, the plants photosynthesize they take the sunlight and convert it into carbohydrate and they store it in their plant cells and if you then feed some of that carbohydrate to your animals the animals start to thrive on it you also with the trampling effect you're laying some of the carbohydrate onto the so surface of the soil and you're also because you're shortening the plant the actual the actual roots on the plant are, itself prunes it can't sustain the whole root mass so again there's a huge amounts of organic matter shed into the soil and all of this this energy that's pumped into the soil is feeding the soil life the ironic thing about it is that we know the system works because it always has done, but scientifically we can't put our finger on one key element because nature is so diverse. The other issue, of course, is funding. Um, what, what we're advocating is actually getting back to a more natural system that uses less inputs. And the majority of research these days is funded by agrochemical companies, companies with a vested interest in selling you something. And this is, this is uh, completely the opposite to what they, they want to look into. So we, I think scientifically we're really struggling to prove that this, this works. We're instead reliant on farmers who are actually doing it on the ground, who are saying it works and are inviting people onto their farm to come and have a look at it. So this field was mob grazed about eight weeks ago and we had about 150 cows in here with their calves at foot, so about 250 animals all told. And they, they stayed on a block of land and we gave them about an acre, slightly less than an acre, for every 12 hour period. So we were moving them twice a day. So they started off on, a, on an acre of land and they moved on to the next acre 12 hours later. And so it took about five days to work their way across the field here. Now as they come into the, to, to this field, obviously they are, the idea of mobbing them together is to, to trample the vegetation. And we can start to see the benefits of mob grazing. So we've got different species coming through. We've got coxfoot coming through. As it gets colder towards the back end of the year, the ryegrass stops growing and the coxfoot starts to come through. So it encourages different species. We've seen uh, earthworms, and evidence of that is the molehills that are appearing. Now, a lot of traditionally, a lot of farmers don't like to see molehills, and if you're making silage, it's a, it's a very good reason because soil can contaminate the silage. But actually, in a mob grazing system, it doesn't matter about the molehills; they're actually creating drainage channels, and they're they're cultivating the earth for us. And if you can smell the soil, it smells really sweet and really rich, and it's crumbly and friable. And this is all because we're injecting this organic matter into the soil through the mob grazing process. Rich, fertile soil like this should be the goal of every arable farmer in the land. Cattle can actually achieve this. And once we bring cattle back onto our soils, we start to heal the whole system. You improve the fertility of the soil. You build, build the whole ecosystem. You build a sustainable farming business. And that is what we're striving for. Music